My name is Jamie. How can I help you? Good morning. I want some information on self-drive tours in the USA. Could you send me a brochure? Of course. Could I have your name, please? Andrea Brown. Thank you. And your address? Twenty-four Ardley Road. Can you spell that? A R D L E I G H Road. Postcode? B H five two O P. Thanks. And can I have your phone number? Is a mobile all right? Fine. It's O double seven eight six six four three O nine one. Thank you. And can I ask you where you heard about world tours from a friend, or did you see an advert somewhere? No, I read about you in the newspaper. Okay, I'll get the brochures and the post to you. But can I give you some information over the phone?、Uh, what kinds of things do you want to do on your holiday? I'm interested in going to California with my family. I've got two children, and we want to hire a car. Okay, we have a couple of self-drive tours there, visiting different places of interest in California. The first one begins in Los Angeles, and there's plenty of time to visit some of the theme parks there. Ah,、oh, that's something on my children's list, so I'd want to include that. <laughs> Good.、Uh, then you drive to San Francisco. From San Francisco, you can drive to Yosemite Park, where you spend a couple of nights. You can choose to stay in a lodge or on the campsite. I don't like the idea of staying in a tent. It'd be too hot. Right. And the tour ends in Las Vegas. Okay. The other trip we can arrange is slightly different. It starts in San Francisco, then you drive south to Cambria. Someone told me there's a really nice castle near Cambria. Will we go near that? Hurst Castle is on that road, so you could stop there. Good. I'd like to do that. Does this trip also go into the desert? No, it continues to Santa Monica, where most people like to stop and do some shopping. We have enough of that at home, so that doesn't interest us. <laughs> okay, well, you could go straight on to San Diego. That's good for beaches, isn't it? That's right. That's a good place to relax, and your children might like to visit the zoo before flying home. I don't think so. We want some time for sunbathing and swimming. So, how many days are the trips, and how much do they cost? The first one I told you about is a self-drive tour through California, which lasts twelve days and covers two thousand and twenty kilometers. The shortest journey is two hundred and six kilometers, and the longest is six hundred and thirty-two kilometers. The cost is five hundred and twenty-five pounds per person. That includes accommodation, car rental, and a flight, but no meals. Okay. And the other trip? That lasts nine days, but you spend only three days on the road. You cover about nine hundred and eighty kilometers altogether. So is that cheaper then? Yes, it's almost a hundred pounds cheaper. It's four hundred and twenty-nine pounds per person, which is a good deal. So that covers accommodation and car hire. What about flights? They aren't included, but these hotels offer dinner in the price. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll be in touch when I've had a chance to look at the brochure. I'm pleased to help. Goodbye. Goodbye. On behalf of LP Clubs, I'd like to welcome you all here today. My name's Sandy Fisher, and I'm one of the fitness managers here. Before we start our tour of the club, I'll just run through some basic information about the facilities we have here, including recent improvements, and explain the types of membership available. Our greatest asset is probably our swimming pool, which at 25 meters isn't Olympic-sized, but now we've expanded it to eight lanes. It's much wider. This means there are rarely more than a couple of people at a time in each lane. Unfortunately, there isn't space for an outdoor pool here, but the glass roof on the swimming pool is partly retractable, which means you can enjoy something of the open-air experience on warmer days. Our recently refurbished fitness suite has all the latest exercise equipment, including ten new running machines and a wide range of weight training machines. Each member is given full training in how to operate the equipment, and there is always a trainer on duty to offer help and advice. Although we do have adult-only times after six and at certain times at weekends. 
children are well catered for. Older children continue to benefit from a wide range of tuition, anything from trampolining to yoga. One thing all our members appreciate about us is that we take very good care of them. This starts on day one with your personal assessment. You are asked to fill in a questionnaire giving details of any health problems. One of our personal trainers will then go through this with you. The trainer will then take you through the safety rules for using the equipment in the fitness suite. During your next exercise session, a personal trainer will work with you to make sure you understand these. It's very important to do this because we really do want to avoid having any sports injuries. There's a lot more to looking after yourself than simply lifting weights. At the end of the personal assessment, the trainer will draw up a plan outlining what you should try to achieve within a six-week period. This will then be reviewed at the end of the six weeks. Now, I'll just quickly run through the types of membership we have available. All members must pay a joining fee of £90 in addition to the rates for the monthly membership fees. Gold membership entitles you to free entry at all LP clubs. There are now LP clubs in all major cities and towns, so if you travel a lot, this will be a great advantage. Individual gold membership costs £50 a month and joint membership for you and your partner will cost £75. Premier membership is for professional people whose work commitments make it difficult for them to use the club during the day and so LP gives booking preferences to Premier members at peak times. This means you'll find it easier to book the sessions at times that suit you. Reciprocal arrangements with other LP clubs are available to Premier members. Premier membership is for individuals only, but you'll be sent passes for guests every month. The monthly fee is £65. You don't have to have any special clothes or equipment when you visit the club. We provide robes and hair dryers in the changing rooms, but it's very important to remember your photo card because you won't be able to get in without it. For people who aren't working during the day... The music... um, hello, Professor. I'm John Wishart. I'm working on my entry for the Global Design Competition. My tutor said you might be able to help me with it. Ah, uh, yes, I got a copy of your drawings. Uh, come in and tell me about it. What sort of competition is it? Well, it's an international design competition and we have to come up with a new design for a typical domestic kitchen appliance. I see. And are there any special conditions? Does it have to save energy, for example? Actually, that was the focus in last year's competition. This year's different. We have to adopt an innovative approach to existing technology, using it in a way that hasn't been thought of before. I see. That sounds tricky. And what kitchen appliance have you chosen? Well, I decided to choose the dishwasher. Interesting. What made you choose that? Well, they're an everyday kitchen appliance in most Australian houses, but they're all pretty boring mm. and almost identical to each other. I think some people will be prepared to pay a little extra for something that looks different. That's a nice idea. I see you've called your design the rock pool. Mm. Why is that? Basically because it looks like the rock pools you find on a beach. The top is made of glass so that you can look down into it. And there's a stone at the bottom. Is that just for decoration? Actually, it does have a function. Instead of pushing a button, you turn the stone. So it's really just a novel way of starting the dishwasher? That's right. It's a really nice design. But what makes it innovative? Well, I decided to make a dishwasher that uses carbon dioxide. In place of water and detergent? How will you manage that? The idea is to pressurise the carbon dioxide so that it becomes a liquid. The fluid is then released into the dishwasher where it cleans the dishes all by itself. Sounds like a brilliant idea. Your system will totally do away with the need for strong detergents. So what happens once the dishes are clean? Well, to allow them to dry, the liquid carbon dioxide and the waste materials all go to an area called the holding chamber. That's where the liquid is depressurised and so it reverts to a gas. 
Then the oil and grease are separated out and sent to the waste system. It sounds like you've thought it all out very thoroughly. So what happens to the carbon dioxide once the process is complete? Not wasted, I hope. Actually, that's where the real savings are made. The carbon dioxide is sent back to the cylinder and can be used again and again. What a terrific idea! Do you think it will ever be built?、Mm, probably not, but that's okay. Well, I'm sure a lot of positive things will come out of your design. Now you seem to have thought about everything. So, what exactly did you need me to help you with? Well, my design has made it to the final stage of the competition, and in a few months' time, I have to give a presentation, and that's the part I was hoping you could help me with. Right. Well, that should be easy enough. What have you managed to do so far? Well, I've got detailed drawings to show how it will work, and I've also written a 500-word paper on it. I see. Well, if you want to stand a good chance of winning, you really need a model of the machine. Yes, I thought I might, but I'm having a few problems. What's the main difficulty so far? Ah, let me guess. Is it the materials? Yes, I want it to look professional, but everything that's top quality is also very expensive. Look, projects like this are very important to us. They really help lift our profile. So why don't you talk to the university about a grant? Oh. I can help you fill out the application forms if you like.、Oh, that would be great. You'd better show me this paper you've written as well. For a global competition such as this, you need to make sure the technical details you've given are accurate and thorough. Oh, that would be a great help. Is there anything else I can do? Well, I'm really nervous. Today we continue our series on ecology and conservation with a look at a particularly endangered member. Of the black bear family, one in ten black bears is actually born with a white coat, which is the result of a special gene that surfaces in a few. Local people have named it the spirit bear, and according to the legends of these communities, its snowy fur brings with it a special power. Because of this, it has always been highly regarded by them. So much that they do not speak of seeing it to anyone else. It is their way of protecting it when strangers visit the area. The white bear's habitat is quite interesting. The bear's strong relationship with the old-growth rainforest is a complex one. The white bear relies on the huge, centuries-old trees in the forest in many ways. For example. The old-growth trees have extremely long roots that help prevent erosion of the soil along the banks of the many fish streams. Keeping these banks intact is important because these streams are home to salmon, which are the bear's main food source. In return, the bear's feeding habits nurture the forest. As the bears eat the salmon. They discard the skin and bones in great amounts on the forest floor, which provide vital nutrients. These produce lush vegetation that sustains thousands of other types of life forms, from birds to insects and more. Today, the spirit bear lives off the coast of the province of British Columbia on a few islands. There is great concern for their survival. Since it is estimated that less than 200 of these white bears remain, the best way to protect them is to make every effort to preserve the delicate balance of their forest environment. In other words, their ecosystem. The greatest threat to the bear's existence is the loss of its habitat. Over many years. Logging companies have stripped the land by cutting down a large number of trees. In addition, they have built roads which have fractured the areas where the bear usually feeds, and many hibernation sites have also been lost. The logging of the trees along the streams has damaged the places where the bears fish. To make matters worse, the number of salmon in those streams is declining. Because there is no legal limit on fishing at the moment, all these influences 
have a negative impact on the spirit bear's very existence, which is made all the more fragile by the fact that reproduction among these bears has always been disappointingly low. And so, what's the situation going forward? Community organizations, environmental groups, and the British Columbia government are now working together on the problem. The government is now requiring logging companies to adopt a better logging method, which is a positive step. However, these measures alone may not be sufficient to ensure a healthy population of the spirit bear in the future. Other steps also need to be taken. While it is important to maintain the spirit bear's habitat, there also needs to be more emphasis on its expansion. The move is justified as it will also create space for other bears that are losing their homes to damp. Good morning, this is Burnham Tourist Office, Martin speaking. Oh, hello. I saw a poster about free things to do in the area, and it said people should phone you for information. I'm coming to Burnham with my husband and two children for a few days on June the 27th, or possibly the 28th, and I'd like some ideas for things to do on the 29th. Yes, of course. OK. Then let's start with a couple of events especially for children. The Art Gallery is holding an event called Family Welcome that day, when there are activities and trails to use throughout the gallery. That sounds interesting. What time does it start? The gallery opens at 10 and the Family Welcome event runs from 10.30 until 2 o'clock. The gallery stays open until 5, and several times during the day they're going to show a short film that the gallery has produced. It demonstrates how ceramics are made, and there'll be equipment and materials for children to have a go themselves. Last time they ran the event, there was a film about painting, which went down very well with the children, and they're now working on one about sculpture. I like the sound of that. And what other events happen in Burnham? Well, do you all enjoy listening to music? Oh, yes. Well, there are several free concerts taking place at different times, one or two in the morning, the majority at lunchtime and a couple in the evening, and they range from pop music to Latin American. The Latin American could be fun. What time is that? It's being repeated several times in different places. They're performing in the Central Library at 1 o'clock, then at 4 it's in the City Museum, and in the evening at 7.30 there's a longer concert in the theatre. Right. I'll suggest that to the rest of the family. Something else you might be interested in is the boat race along the river. Oh, yes. Do tell me about that. The race starts at Offord Marina to the north of Burnham and goes as far as Summer Pool. The best place to watch it from is Charlesworth Bridge, though that does get rather crowded. And who's taking part? Well, local boat clubs, but the standard is very high. One of them came first in the West of England Regional Championship in May this year. It was the first time a team from Burnham has won. It means that next year they'll be representing the region in the National Championship. Now, I've heard something about Paxton Nature Reserve. It's a good place for spotting unusual birds, isn't it? That's right, throughout the year. There is a lake there as well as a river, and they provide a very attractive habitat. So it's a good idea to bring binoculars if you have them. And just at the moment, you can see various flowers that are pretty unusual. The soil at Paxton isn't very common. They're looking good right now. Right. My husband will be particularly interested in that. And there's going to be a talk and slideshow about mushrooms, and you'll be able to go out and pick some afterwards and study the different varieties. Uh-huh. And is it possible for children to swim in the river? Yes. Part of it has been fenced off to make it safe for children to swim in. It's very shallow, and there's a lifeguard on duty whenever it's open. The lake is too deep, so swimming isn't allowed there. OK. We must remember to bring their swimming things in case we go to Paxton. How long does it take to get there by car from Burnham? About 20 minutes, but parking is very limited, so it's usually much easier to go by bus, and it takes about the same time. Right. Well, I'll discuss the options with the rest of the family. Thanks very much for all your help. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye. First of all, let me thank you all for coming to this public meeting to discuss the future of our town. Our first speaker is Shona Ferguson from Barford Town Council.
Shona. Thank you. First, I'll briefly give you some background information. Then I'll be asking you for your comments on developments in the town. Well, as you don't need me to tell you, Barford has changed a great deal in the last 50 years. These are some of the main changes. 50 years ago, buses linked virtually every part of the town and the neighbouring towns and villages. Most people used them frequently, but not now because the bus companies concentrate on just the routes that attract most passengers. So parts of the town are no longer served by buses. Even replacing old, uncomfortable buses with smart new ones has had little impact on passenger numbers. It's sometimes said that bus fares are too high, but in relation to average incomes, fares are not much higher than they were 50 years ago. Changes in the road network are affecting the town. The centre was recently closed to traffic on a trial basis, making it much safer for pedestrians. The impact of this is being measured. The new cycle paths separating bikes from cars in most main roads are being used far more than was expected, reducing traffic and improving air quality. And although the council's attempts to have a bypass constructed have failed, we haven't given up hope of persuading the government to change its mind. Shopping in the town centre has changed over the years. Many of us can remember when the town was crowded with people going shopping. Numbers have been falling for several years, despite efforts to attract shoppers, for instance by opening new car parks. Some people combine shopping with visits to the town's restaurants and cafes. Most shops are small, independent stores, which is good, but many people prefer to use supermarkets and department stores in nearby large towns, as there are so few well-known chain stores here. Turning now to medical facilities. The town is served by family doctors in several medical practices, fewer than 50 years ago, but each catering for far more patients. Our hospital closed 15 years ago, which means journeys to other towns are unavoidable. On the other hand, there are more dentists than there used to be. Employment patterns have changed along with almost everything else. The number of schools and colleges has increased, making that the main employment sector. Services such as website design and accountancy have grown in importance and, surprisingly perhaps, manufacturing hasn't seen the decline that has affected it in other parts of the country. Now I'll very quickly outline current plans for some of the town's facilities before asking for your comments. As you'll know if you regularly use the car park at the railway station, it's usually full. The railway company applied for permission to replace it with a multi-storey car park, but that was refused. Instead, the company has bought some adjoining land and this will be used to increase the number of parking spaces. The Grand, the old cinema in the High Street, will close at the end of the year and reopen on a different site. You've probably seen the building under construction. The plan is to have three screens with fewer seats rather than just the one large auditorium in the old cinema. I expect many of you shop in the indoor market. It's become more and more shabby looking and because of fears about safety, it was threatened with demolition. The good news is that it will close for six weeks to be made safe and redecorated and the improved building will open in July. Lots of people use the library including school and college students who go there to study. The council has managed to secure funding to keep the library open later into the evening, twice a week. We would like to enlarge the building in the not-too-distant future, but this is by no means definite. There's no limit on access to the nature reserve on the edge of town, and this will continue to be the case. What will change, though, is that the council will no longer be in charge of the area. Instead, it will become the responsibility of a national body that administers most nature reserves in the country. OK, now let me ask you if you have... Hello, Helen. Sorry I'm late. Hi, Jeremy. No problem. Well, we'd better work out where we are on our project, I suppose. Yeah, I've looked at the drawings you've done for my story, the forest, 
And I think they're brilliant. They really create the atmosphere I had in mind when I was writing it.、Oh, I'm glad you like them. There are just a few suggestions I'd like to make. Go ahead. Now, I'm not sure about the drawing of the cave. It's got trees all around it, which is great, but the drawing's a bit too static, isn't it?、Mm. I think it needs some action. Yes, there's nothing happening. Perhaps I should add the boy, Malcolm, isn't it? Mm. He would be walking up to it. Yes, let's have Malcolm in the drawing.、Mm. And what about putting in a tiger, the one that he makes friends with a bit later? Maybe it could be sitting under a tree, washing itself. And the tiger stops in the middle of what it's doing when it sees Malcolm walking past. That's a good idea. Okay, I'll have a go at that. Then there's the drawing of the crowd of men and women dancing. They're just outside the forest, and there's a lot going on. That's right. You wanted them to be watching a carnival procession, but、mm. I thought it would be too crowded. Do you think it works like this? Yes, I like what you've done. The only thing is, could you add Malcolm to it without changing what's already there?、Mm. What about having him sitting on the tree trunk on the right of the picture? Yes, that would be fine. And do you want him watching the other people? No, he's been left out of all the fun. So I'd like him to be crying.、Mm. That'll contrast nicely with the next picture where he's laughing at the clowns in the carnival. Right, I'll do that. And then the drawing of the people ice skating in the forest.、Mm, I wasn't too happy with that one because they're supposed to be skating on grass, aren't they? That's right, and it's frozen over. At the moment, it doesn't look quite right.、Mm. I see what you mean. I'll have another go at that.、Mm, and I like the wool hats they're wearing. Maybe you could give each of them a scarf as well. Yeah, that's easy enough. They can be streaming out behind the people to suggest they're skating really fast.、Mm, great. Well, that's all on the drawings. Right. So you finish writing your story, and I just need to finish illustrating it, and my story and your drawings are done. So the next thing is to decide what exactly we need to write about in the report that goes with the stories, and how we're going to divide the work. Right, Helen. What do you think about including a section on how we planned the project as a whole, Jeremy? That's probably quite important. Yeah. Well, you've had most of the good ideas so far. <laughs> how do you feel about drafting something? Then we can go through it together and discuss it. Okay, that seems reasonable. And I could include something on how we came up with the ideas for our two stories, couldn't I? Well, I've started writing something about that. So why don't you do the same, and we can include the two things? Right. So what about our interpretation of the stories? Do we need to write about what we think they show, like the value of helping other people, all that sort of thing? That's going to come up later, isn't it?、Mm. I think everyone in the class is going to read each other's stories and come up with their own interpretations, which we're going to discuss. Oh, I missed that. So it isn't going to be part of the report at all. No, but we need to write about the illustrations because they're an essential element of children's experience of reading the stories.、Mm. It's probably easiest for you to write that section, as you know more about drawing than I do. Maybe, but I find it quite hard to write about. I'd be happier if you did it. Okay. So when do you think we can get this ready? So what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called ethnography. This is a type of research aimed at exploring the way human cultures work. It was first developed for use in anthropology. And it's also been used in sociology and communication studies. So, what's it got to do with business? You may ask. Well, businesses are finding that ethnography can offer them deeper insight into the possible needs of customers, either present or future, as well as providing valuable information about their attitudes towards existing products. And ethnography can also help companies to design new products or services that customers really want. Let's look at some examples of how ethnographic research works in business. One team of researchers did a project for a company manufacturing kitchen equipment. 
They watched how cooks used measuring cups to measure out things like sugar and flour. They saw that the cooks had to check and recheck the contents because although the measuring cups had numbers inside them, the cooks couldn't see these easily. So a new design of cup was developed to overcome this problem, and it was a top seller. Another team of ethnographic researchers looked at how cell phones were used in Uganda, in Africa. They found that people who didn't have their own phones could pay to use the phones of local entrepreneurs. Because these customers paid in advance for their calls, they were eager to know how much time they'd spent on the call so far. So the phone company designed phones for use globally with this added feature. Ethnographic research has also been carried out in computer companies. In one company, IT systems administrators were observed for several weeks. It was found that a large amount of their work involved communicating with colleagues in order to solve problems, but that they didn't have a standard way of exchanging information from spreadsheets and so on. So the team came up with an idea for software that would help them to do this. In another piece of research, a team observed and talked to nurses working in hospitals. This led to the recognition that the nurses needed to access the computer records of their patients no matter where they were. This led to the development of a portable computer tablet that allowed the nurses to check records in locations throughout the hospital. Occasionally, research can be done even in environments where the researchers can't be present. For example, in one project done for an airline, respondents used their smartphones to record information during airline trips, in a study aiming at tracking the emotions of passengers during a flight. So, what makes studies like these different from ordinary research? Let's look at some of the general principles behind ethnographic research in business. First of all, the researcher has to be completely open-minded. He or she hasn't thought up a hypothesis to be tested, as is the case in other types of research. Instead, they wait for the participants in the research to inform them. As far as choosing the participants themselves is concerned, that's not really all that different from ordinary research. The criteria according to which the participants are chosen may be something as simple as the age bracket they fall into, or the researchers may select them according to their income, or they might try to find a set of people who all use a particular product, for example. But it's absolutely crucial to recruit the right people as participants. As well as the criteria I've mentioned, they have to be comfortable talking about themselves and being watched as they go about their activities. Actually, most researchers say that people open up pretty easily, maybe because they're often in their own home or workplace. So, what makes this type of research special is that it's not just a matter of sending a questionnaire to the participants. Instead, the research is usually based on first-hand observation of what they are doing at the time. But that doesn't mean that the researcher never talks to the participants. However, unlike in traditional research, in this case, it's the participant rather than the researchers who decides what direction the interview will follow. This means that there's less likelihood of the researcher imposing his or her own ideas on the participant. But after they've said goodbye to their participants and got back to their office, the researcher's work isn't finished. Most researchers estimate that 70 to 80% of their time is spent not on the collecting of data, but on its analysis, looking at photos, listening to recordings and transcribing them, and so on. The researchers may end up with hundreds of pages of notes. And to determine what's significant, they don't focus on the sensational things or the unusual things. Instead, they try to identify a pattern of some sort in all this data and to discern the meaning behind it. This can result in some compelling insights that can, in turn, feed back to the whole design process.
Good morning, Stretton Festival box office. How can I help you? Oh, hello. My family and I are on holiday in the area, and we've seen some posters about the festival this week. Could you tell me about some of the events, please? Of course. First of all, are there still tickets available for the jazz band on Saturday? There are, but only fifteen pounds. The twelve pound seats have all been sold. Okay, and the venue is the school, isn't it? Yes, that's right. The secondary school. Make sure you don't go to the primary school by mistake. And there's an additional performer who isn't mentioned on the posters. Carolyn Hart is going to play with the band. Oh, I think I've heard her on the radio. Doesn't she play the oboe or flutes or something? Yes, the flute. She usually plays with symphony orchestras, and apparently this is her first time with a jazz band. Well, I'd certainly like to hear her. Then the next thing I want to ask about is the duck races. I saw a poster beside a river. What are they exactly? Well, you buy a yellow plastic duck, or as many as you like. They're a pound each. And you write your name on each one. There'll be several races, depending on the number of ducks taking part. And John Stevens, a champion swimmer who lives locally, is going to start the races. All the ducks will be launched into the river at the back of the cinema. Then they'll float along the river for 500 meters, as far as the railway bridge. And are there any prizes? Yes. The first duck in each race to arrive at the finishing line wins its owner free tickets for the concert on the last night of the festival. You said you can buy a duck. I'm sure my children will both want one. They're on sale at a stall in the market. You can't miss it. It's got an enormous sign showing a couple of ducks. Okay, I'll go there this afternoon. I remember walking past there yesterday. Now, could you tell me something about the flower show, please? Well, admission is free, and the show is being held in Bythewaite Hall. Sorry, how do you spell that? B Y T H W A I T E. Bythewaite. Is it easy to find? I'm not very familiar with the town yet. Oh, you won't have any problem. It's right in the centre of Stretton. It's the only old building in the town. So it's easy to recognise. I know it. I presume it's open all day. Yes, but if you'd like to see the prizes being awarded for the best flowers, you'll need to be there at five o'clock. The prizes are being given by a famous actor, Kevin Shapless. He lives nearby and gets involved in a lot of community events. Gosh, I've seen him on TV. I'll definitely go to the prize giving. Right. I've seen a list of plays that are being performed this week, and I'd like to know which are suitable for my children and which ones my husband and I might go to. How old are your children? Five and seven. What about the mystery of Muldoon? That's aimed at five to ten-year-olds. So, if I take my children, I can expect them to enjoy it more than I do. I think so. If you'd like something for yourself and your husband, and leave your children with a babysitter. You might like to see fire and flood. It's about events that really happened in Stretton two hundred years ago, and children might find it rather frightening. Oh, thanks for the warning. And finally, what about Silly Sailor? <laughs> That's a comedy, and it's for young and old. In fact, it won an award in the Stretton Drama Festival a couple of months ago. Okay. Well, goodbye, and thanks for all the information. I'm looking forward to the festival. Goodbye. Good morning, and welcome to the museum. One with a remarkable range of exhibits, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. My name's Greg, and I'll tell you about the various collections as we go around. But before we go, let me just give you a taste of what we have here. Well, for one thing, we have a fine collection of 20th and 21st century paintings, many by very well-known artists. I'm sure you'll recognize several of the paintings. This is the gallery that attracts the largest number of visitors, so it's best to go in early in the day before the crowds arrive. Then there are the 19th century paintings. The museum was opened in the middle of that century, and several of the artists each donated one work to get the museum started, as it were. So they're of special interest to us. We feel closer to them than to other works. 
The sculpture gallery has a number of fine exhibits, but I'm afraid it's currently closed for refurbishment. You'll need to come back next year to see it properly, but a number of the sculptures have been moved to other parts of the museum. Around the World is a temporary exhibition. You've probably seen something about it on TV or in the newspapers. It's created a great deal of interest because it presents objects from every continent and many countries and provides information about their social context, why they were made, who for, and so on. Then there's the collection of coins. This is what you might call a focused specialist collection because all the coins come from this country and were produced between 2,000 and 1,000 years ago. And many of them were discovered by ordinary people digging their gardens and donated to the museum. All our porcelain and glass was left to the museum by its founder when he died in 1878. And in the terms of his will, we're not allowed to add anything to that collection. He believed it was perfect in itself, and we don't see any reason to disagree. Okay, that was something about the collections, and now here's some more practical information, in case you need it. Most of the museum facilities are downstairs in the basement, so you go down the stairs here. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you'll find yourself in a sitting area with comfortable chairs and sofas where you can have a rest before continuing your exploration of the museum. We have a very good restaurant which serves excellent food all day in a relaxing atmosphere. To reach it, when you get to the bottom of the stairs, go straight ahead to the far side of the sitting area, then turn right into the corridor. You'll see the door of the restaurant facing you. If you just want a snack or if you'd like to eat somewhere with facilities for children, we also have a cafe. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you'll need to go straight ahead, turn right into the corridor, and the cafe is immediately on the right. And talking about children, there are baby changing facilities downstairs. Cross the sitting area, continue straight ahead along the corridor on the left, and you and your baby will find the facilities on the left-hand side. The cloakroom, where you should leave coats, umbrellas, and any large bags, is on the left-hand side of the sitting area. It's through the last door before you come to the corridor. There are toilets on every floor, but in the basement, they're the first rooms on the left when you get down there. Okay. Now, if you've got anything to leave in the cloakroom, please do that now, and then we'll start our tour. Hi, Joanna. Good to meet you. Now, before we discuss your new research project, I'd like to hear something about the psychology study you did last year for your master's degree. So, how did you choose your subjects for that? Well, I had six subjects, all professional musicians and all female. Three were violinists, and there was also a cello player and a pianist and a flute player. They were all very highly regarded in the music world, and they'd done quite extensive tours in different continents, and quite a few had won prizes and competitions as well. Mm. And they were quite young, weren't they? Yes, between 25 and 29. Um, the mean was 27.8. I wasn't specifically looking for artists who'd produced recordings, but this is something that's just taken for granted these days, and they all had. Right. Now, you collected your data through telephone interviews, didn't you? Yes. I realised if I was going to interview leading musicians, it'd only be possible over the phone because they're so busy. I recorded them using a telephone recording adapter. I'd been worried about the quality, but it worked out all right. I managed at least a 30-minute interview with each subject, sometimes longer. Did doing it on the phone make it more stressful? I'd thought it might. Um, it was all quite informal, though, and in fact they seemed very keen to talk. And I don't think using the phone meant I got less rich data. Rather the opposite, in fact. Interesting. And you were looking at how performers dress for concert performances. That's right. Uh, my research investigated the way players see their role as a musician and how this is linked to the type of clothing they decide to wear. 
But that focus didn't emerge immediately. When I started, I was more interested in trying to investigate the impact of what was worn on those listening, and also whether someone like a violinist might adopt a different style of clothing from, say, someone playing the flute or the trumpet. Hmm. It's interesting that the choice of dress is up to the individual, isn't it? Yes. You'd expect there to be rules about it in orchestras, but that's quite rare. You only had women performers in your study.、Mm -hmm. Was that because male musicians are less worried about fashion? I think a lot of the men are very much influenced by fashion, but in social terms, the choices they have are more limited. They'd really upset audiences if they strayed away from quite narrow boundaries.、Mm. Now, popular music has quite different expectations.、Uh, did you read Mike Frost's article about the dress of women performers in popular music? No. Well, he points out that a lot of female singers and musicians in popular music tend to dress down in performances and wear less feminine clothes,、um, like jeans instead of skirts. Uh, and he suggests this is because otherwise they'd just be discounted as trivial. But you could argue they're just wearing what's practical. I mean, a pop music concert is usually a pretty energetic affair. Yes, he doesn't make that point, but I think you're probably right. I was interested by the effect of the audience at a musical performance when it came to the choice of dress. The subjects I interviewed felt this was really important.、Mm. It's all to do with what we understand by performance as a public event. They believed the audience had certain expectations, and it was up to them as performers to fulfil these expectations to show a kind of esteem. They weren't afraid of looking as if they'd made an effort to look good.、Mm. I think in the past the audience would have had those expectations of one another too, but that's not really the case now. Not in the UK, anyway. No. And I also got interested in what sports scientists are doing too, with regard to clothing. Musicians are quite vulnerable physically, aren't they? Because the movements they carry out are very intensive and repetitive.、Mm. So I'd imagine some features of sports clothing could safeguard the players from the potentially dangerous effects of this sort of thing. Yes, but musicians don't really consider it. They avoid clothing that obviously restricts their movements, but that's as far as they go. Anyway, coming back to your own research, do you have any idea where you're going from here? I was thinking of doing a study using an audience, including. As we saw in the last lecture, a major cause of climate change is the rapid rise in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last century. If we could reduce the amount of CO2, perhaps the rate of climate change could also be slowed down. One potential method involves enhancing the role of the soil that plants grow in, with regard to absorbing CO2. Ratan Lal, a soil scientist from Ohio State University in the USA, claims that the world's agricultural soils could potentially absorb 13% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The equivalent of the amount released in the last 30 years, and research is going on into how this might be achieved. Lal first came to the idea that soil might be valuable in this way, not through an interest in climate change, but rather out of concern for the land itself and the people dependent on it. Carbon-rich soil is dark, crumbly, and fertile, and retains some water. But erosion can occur if soil is dry, which is a likely effect if it contains inadequate amounts of carbon. Erosion is, of course, bad for people trying to grow crops or breed animals on that terrain. In the 1970s and 80s, Lal was studying soils in Africa so devoid of organic matter that the ground had become extremely hard, like cement. There, he met a pioneer in the study of global warming, who suggested that carbon from the soil had moved into the atmosphere. This is now looking increasingly likely. Let me explain. For millions of years, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been regulated, in part, by a natural partnership between plants and microbes, tiny organisms in the soil. 
Plants absorb CO2 from the air and transform it into sugars and other carbon-based substances. While a proportion of these carbon products remain in the plant, some transfer from the roots to fungi and soil microbes, which store the carbon in the soil. The invention of agriculture some 10,000 years ago disrupted these ancient soil building processes and led to the loss of carbon from the soil. When humans started draining the natural topsoil and ploughing it up for planting, they exposed the buried carbon to oxygen. This created carbon dioxide and released it into the air. And in some places, grazing by domesticated animals has removed all vegetation, releasing carbon into the air. Tons of carbon have been stripped from the world's soils, where it's needed, and pumped into the atmosphere. So, what can be done? Researchers are now coming up with evidence that even modest changes to farming can significantly help to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Some growers have already started using an approach known as regenerative agriculture. This aims to boost the fertility of soil and keep it moist through established practices. These include keeping fields planted all year round and increasing the variety of plants being grown. Strategies like these can significantly increase the amount of carbon stored in the soil, so agricultural researchers are now building a case for their use in combating climate change. One American investigation into the potential for storing CO2 on agricultural lands is taking place in California. Soil scientist Wendy Silver of the University of California, Berkeley, is conducting a first-of-its-kind study on a large cattle farm in the state. She and her students are testing the effects on carbon storage of the compost that is created from waste, both agricultural, including manure and corn stalks, and waste produced in gardens, such as leaves, branches and lawn trimmings. In Australia, soil ecologist Christine Jones is testing another promising soil enrichment strategy. Jones and 12 farmers are working to build up soil carbon by cultivating grasses that stay green all year round. Like composting, the approach has already been proved experimentally. Jones now hopes to show that it can be applied on working farms and that the resulting carbon capture can be accurately measured. It's hoped in the future that projects such as these will demonstrate the role that farmers and other land managers can play in reducing the harmful effects of greenhouse gases. For example, in countries like the United States, where most farming operations use large applications of fertiliser, changing such long-standing habits will require a change of system. Ratan Lal argues that farmers should receive payment, not just for the corn or beef they produce, but also for the carbon they can store in their soil. Another study being carried out...